appreciated. Thank Without you. objection. Thank you, Mr. President. And I am glad to be here tonight with you, uh, a member of this body who probably more than most understands um, the consequences of this government shutdown. And, uh, and, and uh, maybe 100 people in this body and 435 people across the, in the House of Representatives, I'd be surprised if there were somebody among us that would be less likely to close the government down over politics than the presiding officer from the Commonwealth of Virginia, because he knows how important it is to the, among other people, the dedicated public servants that live in his state and work for the federal government. Tonight, Mr. President, I wanted to come to the floor to talk about a group of men and women who most people serving in this chamber know very little about. They may know nothing about. Men and women whose livelihoods are at stake and are being held hostage by a small band of extremists dead set on shutting down the government for their own political purposes. And these are America's federal wildland firefighters. This is a, a photo of, maybe I should put it up here. Wildland firefighters, federal wildland firefighters responding to the Pine Gulch fire in Colorado. The picture in, in many ways sort of says it all. And one of the things it says is that neither you nor I nor anybody on this floor really can fully imagine or describe what it, what it must be like to do this work. I can't imagine parachuting through yellow skies that can't allow you to even see where the ground is and dropping down in the total wilderness. I'd be very surprised if anybody in this chamber could comprehend what it must be like to hear nothing but the roar of chainsaws and crackling brush all around you while tankers and helicopters overhead on top of you dump blood red retardant and water to suppress the flames or what it's like to carry food enough food to sustain you for days at a time there's nobody that's going to come feed you axes and water a sleeping bag all on your on your back with a pack that's just made heavier by unrelenting smoke and unrelenting fire doing the heartbreaking work of slashing away at brush and small trees. I'm sorry, the backbreaking work. It's probably heartbreaking at some time. The backbreaking work of slashing away at brush and small trees, gasoline for roaring wildfire, making a fire line until you get to mineral soil. I don't know about any of that. I can't imagine the flood of relief. After 16 hours of grueling work, getting back to the black, Mr. President, that's the area that's already been burned. And that's a sign that finally, after those 16 hours, or however many of those hours are, that you're in a safe spot. And for all that effort, making $15 an hour, less than somebody could make it Subway or another fast food restaurant. I don't, I never have lived in my car as a price of doing the job that I was asked to do, sleeping cramped in the back seat after a 16 hour day because you can't afford a place to live or the loneliness of being out without your wife and kids for months and months at a time while working on a, on a fire. I don't know how it must feel to work a thousand hours of overtime every year for your country and know that your family is still on food stamps because no matter how hard you work, you can't make enough money to put food on the table of your family. I don't know what that feels like. 
But that's the reality for America's wildland firefighters. Helicopter repellers and engine operators and hand crews and hot shots and smoke jumpers make up wildland firefighting crews. And these men and women parachute into fire, they walk into fire, they drive into fire. There's a, a picture of a smoke jumper parachuting through smoke. You probably can barely see it. It gives you a sense of the danger of it. These are highly trained experts in their field. Believe it, for, take it from me, they are in peak physical condition. And in the last few decades, the wildfire season has extended and extended and extended by over 70 days. It's common for politicians to say, we don't have a wildfire season anymore. It's all year round. But the reality for these workers is that they're having to work those fires all year round. And the fires have become increasingly intense if you talk to people who've had to fight them on the ground. Mr. President, there are people that have been doing this, believe it or not, for 25 years, for 30 years. They've seen it, what it used to look like and what it looks like now. They can tell you that the intensity has changed because of climate change and because of the historic drought that we faced. And by the way, important for this body to understand, this is not just in the West. You know, we have, we have obviously been beset by fires and by drought in the West. But right now, w while we're here, there are wildfires in Louisiana. We've seen the total destruction, the tragedy of Maui. Even New Jersey this year has seen wildfires and has been ravaged by them uh, in that state. <clears throat> I, I, I heard of uh, a firefighter say to me the other day that the, 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 the wildland firefighters are like the Swiss Army knife of first responders because in the off season they support hurricane relief efforts in the south. They administered vaccines at the peak of the COVID epidemic. They've even helped with the space shuttle recovery. And two years ago, during the infrastructure bill, as part of a recognition that the drought was creating a huge problem for us in the West. We we made things a little better for our wildland firefighters, and the bipartisan infrastructure provided over 20,000 wildland firefighters a temporary pay raise, and that's been a godsend for them. And by the way, it's only bringing them up to, I mean, it's barely what they should make, but at least you can make it on what we're paying them now. But that money is fast expiring, and this lifeline is almost gone. And it, it, you know, it, for them it meant that skilled firefighters were able to remain in the profession who might have otherwise quit. And by the way, when you ask them about that, the, the reason they've stayed is because they have such a sense of mission. That's part of it. They also know, Mr. President, they don't know who would replace them, who would take their job, who would walk in their shoes, who can't make, you know, who's ma making the kind of money that they're making. But they finally had a sense that maybe the nation was recognizing their work and that they could at least provide for their families. On Friday, I met with a group of wildland firefighters in Grand Junction, Colorado, who shared their stories with me. I would encourage every member of this body to do the same. They describe being so disconnected from their families and friends during fire season that they feared they would lose them. They feared slipping into deep depressions because of the grueling nature of the work and the months spent away from home. They talked about riding a bike back and forth to work because they couldn't afford to maintain a car. Feelings of having your passion for your job Remember, these are people who, in theory, are, you know, inspired by the sunset. Having your passion for your job exploited by the federal government, who knows you'll show up. 
because you love the job, even without the pay you deserve, year after year, fire after fire after fire. Grappling with the trauma of seeing other people's homes burned to the ground and losing crew members in the line of duty. One crew leader in Colorado told me, Mr. President, she's lost three firefighters to suicide. Another just lost a friend to cancer, likely due to smoke inhalation. Wildland firefighters are 10 to 20 times more likely to commit suicide than the average American. And they face a 43 percent increased risk for developing cancer. A firefighter told me, none of us wants to be a millionaire. We just want to do good work, the work that we love. These are the men and women saving lives. These are the men and women saving homes, defending the 640 million acres, thank God, of American public lands. And Congress's failure to act has forced talented firefighters to leave the profession, which is the last thing they want to do. And it's going to cost us the next generation of wildland firefighters who are needed more than ever because of climate change and what it's doing to the West and fire seasons all across this country. And Mr. President, really importantly, the continuing resolution that you support and that I support, that we've passed miraculously with almost 80 votes in the Senate showing the broad bipartisan support there is all across this country for keeping our government open. That bill will expend, extend their pay by a couple of paychecks. And that's really important. But I'm here to say that our wildland firefighters need a permanent raise. Something we could do today is pass the Wildland Fire Firefighter Paycheck Protection Act to permanently extend the pay increase in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Believe me, that is the least we could do for these men and women. We owe our wildland firefighters so much more than just fair pay. They deserve paid leave, housing benefits, and mental health care. And that's why I've introduced Tim's Act with Congressman Neguse, also from my colleague from Colorado, which would provide all of that and ensure that every wildland firefighter makes at least $20 an hour. That doesn't seem unreasonable. <clears throat> Our bill is named for Tim Hart, a smoke jumper who lost his life after parachuting into a wildland fire in New Mexico. And Mr. President, this is a photo of Tim Hart. I've been fortunate, fortunate more fortunate than you can imagine to meet Tim's wife, Michelle, who is upholding his legacy through her relentless support of Tim's, what she calls Tim's fire family. And that's what I met the other day, was a, was a family. That's what anybody here, if you had been here and, or had been in Grand Junction, that's what you would have thought. And Michelle has been kind enough to share a bit about Tim with me. Tim was a practical joke, joker. He loved a glass of rye whiskey, neat, and he loved Halloween. But mostly he loved his calling. He loved his passion, being a wildland firefighter. Every year, if all, all he, every year, he would consider it all worth it. The bad pay, sleeping out of his truck, leaving Michelle to put his life at risk. And every year the answer was yeah. Every year the answer was yes. It's worth it. He answered yes for his country, his brothers and sisters in fire, and for his love of our nation's landscape. These firefighters are much more, Mr. President, than the blazes that they battle, and the least we could do is pay them a living wage. As I mentioned, there's a saying among wildland firefighters, which is, they pay us in sunsets. And I'm here today, Mr. President, to tell you that is not enough. 
that it is not enough. And that it is this country's duty to support these men and women. Our nation's duty to support these firefighters who are defending us. There's nobody else that's going to step into the breach if we lose them. And someday there'll be somebody coming to this floor, standing here from the state of Colorado or maybe the Commonwealth of Virginia who's going to say, if only we had done it differently back then. We need to keep this government open, Mr. President, for the, the nation depends on it. We need to permanently raise wildland water, wildfire pay. And after we do that, I hope we'll come together, past Tim's Act, to give our wildland firefighters just a little bit of what they finally deserve. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll.